right, John, you ready to have some fun today? I am. I am. Uh, Tyler, I know you've been feeling better before, but you ready to have some fun today, brother? Yeah, let's do it, Kevin. <laughs> time out. Tyler, who are we taking a time out with today? Well, thank you, Kevin. Today we have a seminal, ladies and gentlemen, from the Florida State University, John Sheehan. Here, and he's also, uh, he ends up, he's also the president and CEO of the Rochester Rio. John, thanks for having us, uh, you know, coming into this uh, conversation with Kevin and I this, uh, on this lunch break. And I wanted to ask you, John, who's your favorite Florida State Seminole of all time? Well, I'm biased. Uh, I graduated in 93, which is the best class ever. So <laughs> won the national championship. So it's a hard, it's a hard one between Charlie Ward and Warwick Dunn, uh, my two favorite wow. uh, Knowles, because I went to school with both of them because they're both outstanding human beings. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a, that's not always the legacy at FSU, but, uh, <laughs> but those, those guys really represent and obviously, uh, you know, took us to a whole new level. So. Man, more. Yeah. Those are some big time classic names right there. And going to a school like that, I would have been lost uh, my first day you on campus. A classic <laughs> or a classic. I like classic. <laughs> and that's probably why my parents didn't let me go to school in Florida because those beaches would have been calling my name, not class. So <laughs> probably, probably, probably. We're moving yeah, out of that. Right? I always love learning from people uh, as far as their music taste. I think uh, Tyler and I are big music buffs ourselves. If you had to listen to one song on repeat the rest of your life, what song would you pick? You know, it's cheesy, but I've been a Don't Stop Believing fan for a long time. My uh, my first concert was I was 16 years old. My mom lent me her Datsun 210, and I drove to Lakeland, Florida to see Journey play with Steve Perry. Wow. And it was the last Perry was on. So I've actually uh, got that credit. Not a lot of, not a lot of people even my age uh, have that credential. So uh, Were you, know, you the was, reason uh, you left Journey? <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I think at 16, it was too young for me to have any <laughs> I didn't know if you stormed the stage, scared him a little bit. I don't know. No, but it's an interesting thing because he came out with a, an album recently, Steve Perry did. And uh, like, you know, being on hiatus for 30 years and you don't realize when you're 16 that this guy's the age of your father right up on the stage. You know, you think like this guy's in his 20s, you know, he's like 32, I guess, you know, he's 72 now. So you, know, you, <laughs> well, you realize something when you get older you know <laughs> yeah you shared uh, it sounded like your first car might have been that Dodson there uh but uh i wanted to ask what was your first job my first job um my first job was working uh real job was working at ponderosa as a fry cook at 16 um which was how did that the soft serve ice cream the unlimited man i used to hammer that uh, as a kid it was good stuff. And then, you know, you'd have a little uh, accident or something, and, you know, a tray of steaks would get left out. And so everybody working would go to somebody's house afterward and have a barbecue. And, you know, it was, it was fun. It was, you got to learn about, well, you got to learn about working people. You worked really hard, right. For very little money. And, um, you know, and you, you learn the importance of, you know, maybe I should stay in school. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, John, if, uh, if I was up there, I'm down here in Texas right now. If you're okay. taking Kevin, Kevin and I out to eat up there at the 585, where are we going? Well, you know, I've had some really, I haven't had a bad meal in Rochester. It's one of the things that grows on you in Rochester is the food and the music, right? And, um, and so for me, like I've been to Rococo, I've been to, you know, I've been down uh, on Park to Jines and, um, and, and to all the restaurants in that area. Um, I'm blanking on the noodle place down there, but I really like that. Um, uh -huh. And then uh -huh. noodle? Yeah, yeah, hot, yeah, hot noodle. That's it. It's one of my favorite places for to go and to take out. And then the other, um, you know, the, the, the standby though is I live downtown. So one of the things I want to do is really get a feel for Rochester my first year here. And, and so I live on Washington Street. And of course, the dinosaur barbecue is walking distance. So it's always top of mind. <laughs> so I find myself sauntering into the bar there to have a Diet Coke and wings. And, you know, I, I, uh, I can't get past the wings usually. But it's, uh, it's a great place. <laughs> Tyler knows a little thing about barbecue. He used to be a pit boss himself, I believe. <laughs> yeah, and there's another barbecue in town, Sticky Lips. I've been there, which is just as good. Uh, oh, yeah. Just a little further, just not, I can't walk there. So that's the only <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome it's always it's always fun to hear people that have uh, not from not from rochester myself originally and coming up here and really just uh, I, I, the, the food scene is just out of this world so really i want to ask because uh, you're not you were born in rochester then you were sharing with us that you grew up down in florida 
Um, now that you're back, how 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 much has it changed? What what was the first thing that you did the, those first couple of days as you stepped in as a president? Well, you know the thing about uh, um, the thing the thing about my coming here is I, I, my mom's from Binghamton, my dad's from New York City, my grandfather was a bus driver in New York City, my mom's dad was a uh, an IBMer for thirty years, and so I've spent a lot of time in New York State. And there's a lot of history from my family here, so I've never actually lived in Rochester. And my parents went to Geneseo, so they never actually lived in Rochester. I just happened to, it happened to be, St. Mary's happened to be the nearest hospital. So um, I've never worked in New York State before. So coming into this environment, I spent seven years in, in Ohio, um, which is, you know, those are tough winters and it's a tough state to be in. And New York to me felt like coming home. And so what was, what, what was apparent to me coming in is I had a very um, talented team of people who had built a business that, um, that is unique and very technical. And so there's a lot of ownership, right? So coming into an environment where you've got really brilliant people who are younger uh, than you, who are really dedicated to what they do and, and want to tell you about it all the time, that's a really good situation to walk into, right? Because lots of times you walk into situations where everybody's burned out, nobody really believes in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're there to sort of resuscitate the vision and kind of get everybody breathing again, right? That's not the case um, in, in this organization or in, in Rochester in general. You know, everything that I've been exposed to since I got to Rochester is about bringing Rochester back, which is very much in line with, you know, the Rochester Rio and Agilix Health succeeding, right? Because we want to be a part of Rochester's success. Mm -hmm. And that's a feeling you get when you walk into this community and having, you know, been born here, right? I haven't actually lived here, but, you know, the idea that this isn't the job I thought I would be in um, at this point in my career, but the idea that I'm, I'm here and I'm sort of helping my hometown uh, move in a different direction, that, that feels really good to me. It feels like I'm supposed to be here. So that's, that's kind of been the, the feeling initially. And, and then I've just got a great team of people I'm working with, so. Fascinating. Yeah, you weren't brought in to resuscitate. I love that one. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe a little bit. Yeah, yeah, well, John, I was just going to kind of dive into like your, your career path to being a president and a CEO of a company. Sure. Um, where where did that start? And, and when did you know you were going to be a president or a CEO someday? <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you the story. It's, 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 um, so I came out of Florida State in 93. I had, uh, I got married in 95. I uh, have had two kids, they're uh, Jack and Hannah. They're 11 months apart, true Irish twins. So I needed a job. And I realized that I wasn't gonna get a job with a creative writing degree that was gonna support a family, right? I wasn't gonna find myself. I wasn't going to Europe. It was- You'd be a you starving know, artist, no, just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write for money. So I started working in programs. I started working, my mom's a psychiatric nurse practitioner and, and uh, my mother-in-law was actually a grant writer. I got into kind of writing grants and working in programs. And, and then I, I wrote a grant for something called assertive community treatment. At the time, Jeb Bush was the governor in, in Florida and they were, what they, they were deinstitutionalizing the uh, state hospitals. They had a federal consent decree. So there was a lot of reason to move people out of the state hospital. And there was a guy named Tommy Thompson who was the HHS secretary at the time who was promoting this idea of the hospital in the community. It was a great idea. We were gonna move all the mentally ill people that had been in the hospital for 30 years into the community. And then we were gonna manage them in the community and nothing was gonna go wrong, right? <laughs> and what ended up happening was, it was a disaster. And they moved the majority of people from where they called GPW in Acadia, Florida into the Tampa Bay area, into St. Petersburg in particular, which is where I uh, was living and grew up. A little town called Gulfport there. So the ERs were overrun with the mentally ill on a Friday and Saturday night who, you know, had learned, you know, bad behavior, you know, there was drinking and drugging going on. I didn't go out at the state hospital, but there was a lot of bad things happening in ERs at the time. You guys might be a little young for this, but, you know, there was a time at, you know, at six o'clock when you watch the news, they would talk about the overcrowding in the ERs and the mentally ill and the, the issues. And, and St. Anthony's Hospital in St. Petersburg was probably the busiest psych emergency room in the country. And so I would go in there all the time with my patients as the director of this program. I wrote the grant, they made me the director because nobody else wanted the job. So I got really good at, you know, working with people who were disabled and had this issue and condition. And I was basically a case manager for 150 of the most intensive uh, people. And so that teaches you a lot about the system of care, right? And so I was in the ER a lot. And there was a particular ER physician, her name was Terry Bradley. And I would see Terry a lot. 
because she took good care of my patients and she always kind of recognized me and she, you know it's kind of that community thing you get to know like I know the the chief of, of the fire department in uh in St. Pete because we were out on calls together in the middle of the night a lot right I know a lot of the police officers because of that I got to know the ER physician what I didn't know about Terry was that uh she owned every ER practice in about 11 different hospitals in the system that was forming that was going to become Baker Health System which I I uh, talked a little bit about, but Baker Health System formed when Rick Scott came to Tampa Bay and decided that, you know, HCA was going to take over all the nonprofits. And my mentor, a guy named Frank Murphy, met with all the other nonprofit CEOs and said, we can't let this happen. We need to form some type of a, 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 a way to operate together where we still keep our community focus. And so that's how Baker Health System started to form. Well, Terry was a big part of that conversation. I knew nothing about that. I was taking care of a bunch of sick people in the community, right? But for some reason, um, people were watching what I was doing. And I had no idea. I was 29 years old. I had no idea that that was going on. And a couple of years later, I was recruited to a, a, a national company. I was doing some grant writing. And for whatever reason, I was out in Las Vegas uh, writing a grant. And, um, and I had a, a call from Baker Health System a guy uh, that I knew from the, my time there, I'd done some consulting with them too. And he actually came out to Las Vegas and, and recruited me to come back to Baycare to be the director of business development, which is a big deal because Baycare was a big high profile health system. It was the, the gig at that point time in healthcare. And so that was sort of a, a mid-level position with a great organization. I could be home all the time. And I took it and I flew back and the guy that um, hired me got fired before I got there. Right. So I'm, I'm sitting in this office and I'm nobody's talking to me and I'm thinking I shouldn't have done this. I had a great job. I had a great gig. And, you know, what am I doing sitting here? And then all of a sudden I started getting called into the CEO's office. Um, and I, like I mentioned, this guy, Frank Murphy, he was like, he's like a, well, at that point he was, he was uh, everything you would think of a CEO modeling for a team would be right. He was larger than life. He was like a leprechaun. He was brilliant. He met Deming. He knew all about Six Sigma and things I knew nothing about because I was an English major, right? He understood that variation in healthcare is where all the problems are, right? If you can deliver care to a standard and you can do that over and over again, that's half the battle. And, and eliminating that variation and eliminating that, um, that guesswork that goes into what do we do now? Um, so all those great things that I didn't know I was going to learn, right? I knew were present in this guy when I first met him. And about the fourth time that he said, all right, now get out of my office after drawing every ounce of knowledge out of my head, right? And writing it on a whiteboard. His assistant came up to me and was like, he really likes you on the way out of the office. I was like, really? Because I had me. And she's like, no, he really does. He, 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 he likes you because he makes fun of you. He doesn't make fun of anybody. He doesn't like anybody. Really? <laughs> you know, as, as a leader now, I get it, right? But, and I get how assistants understand you better than anybody. And they're probably trying to help people understand you better on the way out the door. Um, but I knew none of that at that point. Right. All I knew was I was recruited into this job. The CEO, for whatever reason, keeps asking me questions, probably because he's getting ready to fire me. He wants to know what I know before he fires me. And then uh, one day he calls me in for my fifth session and he says, now I want you to go down to St. Anthony's Hospital. You're the new uh, uh, vice president of behavioral medicine. So, well, uh, Frank, I, uh, you know, I've never worked in a hospital. I mean, I've never been a hospital administrator. I mean, I've worked in, you know, and I've been a psych tech and I've worked in different things, but he said, no, go down there. It'll be great. Meet with, meet with, I won't say the guy's name, but he said, meet with the CEO down there and uh, he'll give you your keys and everything. And so Frank's the CEO of Baycare. You're not really sure if Frank can tell the other hospital CEOs what to do. I'm scared to death, right? Because I've met this guy. He's not a, he's, he's not a nice guy, right? He's, you know, he's <laughs> so I go down, I meet with him, I interview with him. Maybe 10 minutes after that, right? I'm in the interview. He stops the interview. He says, I don't think you qualify for this job. I'm like, you know, I don't think I am either. I, you know, <laughs> I actually agreed with him, got embarrassed, got up, walked out, called Frank and said, Frank, you know, and, I, and I'm not comfortable calling Frank. Like I never called Frank before, but I'm like, the guy threw me out of his office. He doesn't think I'm qualified. I think he's right. Why don't I just go back to doing the job? He hired me. And he's like, no, 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 no. Go back down there tomorrow. Everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Just go back down. So I go down there tomorrow. And the guy's got my keys. It's got my office ready. And so I'm, so now I'm, you know, now I'm thinking, all right, you know, I'm sitting in my office and looking around and thinking, okay, well, this may not last long. I might as well enjoy it. 
So I put my badge on, I'm walking through the halls and who do I see coming down the hall is uh, Terry Bradley, the, that ear physician I mentioned. She said, I was wondering when you were gonna get here. Frank Murphy told me that he had been talking to you and he thought you might be a good fit down here. And I said, send him down here as soon as he can. Okay? <laughs> and that is why I'm sitting here talking to you guys today because that ER physician liked something that I was doing in the community for her patients. And she, I'm sure, and I don't know the full story. I still have lunch with Frank every once in a while. He's never, he's never told me the full story, but there was a reason, right, that, that I was there. And it had nothing to do with anything I did intentionally. Right? It had to do with some, something I was doing when I thought no one else was watching. And, and that's, that's the lesson I try to give to uh, young leaders is it's not really what, what I think, right? Yeah. It's about the job you do and what the people you help and the things that you believe in, how they come across, right? And, and, and that's, that's really about being yourself, right? And, and, and that's the lesson. It's not about being something else. Yep. It's about right. finding a way to be yourself in a way that, you know, you know, you can still be CEO, right? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think most leaders, uh, as they, as they grow and what I've seen over in my short career, right. Is that, um, there's certainly people that want that trajectory of being that president or being that manager leader. And, uh, they focus more on the relationship of the individual who will be then the person to promote them, um, instead of driving the action necessary, like you're saying, and doing stuff when you think nobody else is watching. And we were just having a conversation, Tyler and I, the other day about, uh, he, he said, he used this quote, and I'll bring it up again, as air on the side of action, right? Um, I think that sometimes we get so caught up of uh, paralysis from over-analysis that some people just don't do anything, um, but say they do a lot. Uh, so I love what you shared as far as you never know who's looking at the same time. So you, gi you give me and Tyler a lot of hope that we potentially could be in that president and CEO role uh, ourselves in the future. Where I wanted to kind of go with the conversation, seeing that you're, I would call you an expert in behavioral health is that's really the top of mind for a lot of CEOs today, right? Um, we, mm -hmm. we focus really more on the physical safety of our workforce before the pandemic, for whatever reason that may be. And now here we are post pandemic, and we're talking about mental health. And, and we're starting to see that how isolation is, is really not a good thing for humans in some cases. What have you seen as far as, uh, and how does that make you a better leader today of just being more emotionally aware from your previous roles, uh, working with mental health and, and, and the disabled? I, I think it's really important to understand, if, if you want to understand my career, right? I'm a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. I reported to the system CEO of Baker Health System for 11 years, the Frank Murphy for five, a guy named Steve Mason for, for six, because, I mean, you yeah. know, but because they both believed that behavioral health was going to be the most significant challenge we faced in healthcare going forward. These are, you know, these are two very well-known CEOs in, in, in the business. And there are others, you know, all, all around the country that saw that early, right? And so behavioral health had to be protected because as a specialty, it's always been, you know, we've always been seen as less than, right? Um, and, and I've sat in many, conversations with heart surgeons explaining to me the most important organ in the, in the body is the heart. And I think, well, well yeah, the brain controls the heart and every other organ. So I don't know about that, but we'll see what happens over What time. is up with those cardiologists? They have, they have the so now, biggest egos. <laughs> well, you know, I, if, you, if you have a heart problem, you want to see what happens. I want a confident person. Heart, yeah. <laughs> we need heart as well. We don't do the brain as well as we could, right? Um, so with the mapping of the brain and all of the genetic uh, advances that we've made. And the idea that, you know, we give people a lot of medication for behavioral health, but we don't understand how any of it works. Honestly, there's, there's a chemical reaction. We get a certain behavior uh, that's better than the behavior we got before. You know, we call that success, right? There's so much more to learn about the brain and how it works. And that's going to lead to so many more effective treatments. And that's why if you look at the digital age and what's going to be lost in the digital versus the in-person, I don't worry about that as much because I think the treatments for behavioral health are going to be deliverable in a much more convenient way than you can any other specialty like kidneys and heart and other chronic conditions. But if you look at the importance of behavioral health from a business standpoint, in 2008, when we strengthened parity under the Affordable Care Act, and I spent five years running one of the largest health, the largest health home in the country 
under 2703 of the Affordable Care Act. There were 35 pilots for behavioral health. We had the largest in Ohio for, for adults and kids. And John Kasich was actually a big, um, a, a big supporter of that. He's got a family member and, and it, was a, it was a big deal for Ohio. It was a big deal for me learning how you can break through some of the ways we've done it just, just by changing systemically how we deliver antiquated care, right? Because all the care we, we deliver today is probably 20 years too old, right? And, and, and what's happening in the digital age is we're starting to look at all the other things that we could be doing. At the same time, the market is saying, well, you haven't treated behavioral health for 30 years. Parity was strengthened in 2008. Now the Affordable Care Act actually requires payers to pay for things the same. So in theory, hearts and, and minds should be paid for the same, even though that's going to take a while to catch up um, from some liability action. But, but essentially, insurers now know that they can't just ignore behavioral health before they could say, we're going to start a carve out. We're only going to give you five sessions. And if you go to the hospital, we're not going to pay for most of the stay. That's all gone, right? They have to pay for it now. And so when you're United Healthcare and you're taking first dollar risk on Medicaid in Oklahoma, right? You have to have an answer for what are we going to do with the 30% of the population that we never had to treat before, right? And by the way, it's probably 40, 50, 60 because we've underdiagnosed and we have no idea how much damage has been done from COVID to both adults who are going to react um, situationally and children who are going to react developmentally, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got two big issues that you've got to deal with. We're just starting to see the tip of that, right? We're just starting to see the anger and the frustration and the real damage that's been done to families. And you know, it's just, there's just a lot coming. Mm -hmm. And so, um, from my perspective, there's a greater understanding. There's a greater understanding of stigma. Where I get concerned is that we're going to go backward when people like Greg Abbott come out and before they know a word about what happened in a, in a horrific shooting, you know, they get everything wrong in their initial statement, but they remember the talking point that, you know, it must have been somebody with a mental illness, right? When the reality is, is that people with a mental illness are less likely than the general population to commit a violence and more likely to be the victim of a violent act, particularly at the hands of law enforcement. Um, and law enforcement's gotten a lot better over the years, right? Um, but, but there's a lot packed into the behavioral health, mental health question, right? It's, a, it's not a simple conversation and it goes from prevention when we, can, when we can identify children early on that have a concern, right? To intervention, we don't do that well right now, right? To them, when someone's an adult and they have a, a, a burgeoning mental illness to the point that we don't intervene there and then we get someone who's going to be a, a ward of the state in many cases right and, and what can we do better if we follow a disease process like we follow for every other illness in this country mm -hmm. that's the only way we solve it mm -hmm. and and modern tools will help us catch up and that's why I'm such a supporter of the tele and the digital and and I started with you know a lot of those companies have started up trying to solve a problem. So you know, you've seen some of these digital startups that were started by insurance companies, you know, Ginger and, you know, some of the talk space, some of these, you know, the idea that we've got to fill this space with something and we're, there aren't enough therapists in the country to fill it. And so coaching becomes a, an alternative. You know, some places are looking at, you know, AI as, you know, somebody's interacting with an AI um, uh, computer that's texting them, right? And, and that has shown in studies that has actually shown own improvement so something is better than nothing right mm -hmm. so so how do we how do we take all of that good work that's being done in the digital space sort of outside of healthcare? and i think this is starting by the way and i think the market's driving it now you've got to take all of those big ideas and crash them into the reality of the healthcare platform that exists today mm -hmm. and start to transform it right that's where we talk about you know the the idea that that hospitals and big hospital systems have become more like holding companies and more like steel mills, if you're going to use an analogy, right? And that disruption is necessary to sort of freshen up how we do it, but also to really look at where's the value, you know, where is, you know, what, what is the debate between for-profit and non-profit healthcare? Where is the value for patients in, in digital health that doesn't exist in, you know, the current state, right? What is the offset? What do you lose if you see a doctor digitally versus going into the office to see the same person that you've seen for 20 years, right? Are they gonna be able to see something that that doctor you just started seeing on a video screen doesn't see, right? Those are all legitimate questions. 
but they they drive a narrative that hasn't really been alive in my career much mm -hmm. until the last five to seven years. So that's been, I think that's what gives me some hope is that we're paying attention to it. Stigma's going on. And I was, that's what I was going to say. And it sounds like you're really just combating a lot of old thought, right? Uh, a lot of old thought and assumptions like you had shared with, with one of those mass uh, shootings, uh, one of the many that unfortunately we've had here now, um, that everybody assumes that, that it's mental health. And, and that's something that obviously data uh, combats and obviously puts an emphasis and a focus. And, and it, it sounds like from, from your perspective, obviously, and what you've seen is that resources are going towards like cancer and Alzheimer's and some of these other things instead of the overall well-being of, of, of the brain itself and, and how that relates to the rest of the body. So great stuff. I, I, I'm fascinated that and I'm glad that uh, you're seeing positive changes because we're seeing it in the professional world where now this is that, that stigma to say that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm burning out here is, is not a uh, death sentence, right? Where it's like, oh, yeah. we don't want you to move on to the next one. Uh, you're broken. We can't fix you. Like, let's go find somebody that's already put together. So um, something that you said is uh, when you talk about um, the coaching and the therapies and things like this, what do you think yeah. are some of the most effective ways for organizations to really prioritize mental health? And what are some of the things that you've done maybe as a leader at your own organization to kind of promote that safe space and that environment where people feel comfortable talking about some of these well-being uh, initiatives or, 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 or challenges that they're facing both personally and professionally? You know, I think we've all had to change our leadership style. You know, I came up in, um, you know, I came up as a healthcare administrator. You know, I was trained by some of the best, but I was trained old school, right? It was very much a top-down type mentality. Um, I was lucky I came up in Baycare Health System where we, we always emphasized coaching. And so um, I, I, you know, I was sort of trained formally in how to coach, um, but coaching was sort of a tool. It wasn't the overriding, um, uh, it, it, it wasn't the culture, right? So, so the culture was salute and get it done. And so you have to fundamentally change that, I think, with and that started with the millennial generation, right? And I have a couple of millennials, so I was sort of seeing that at home before I was seeing it at work. But the why is very important. And so you, you generally today have to take a, a much more educational approach, particularly if, you, if you're running a large organization. So I came from, my last gig, I had 800 you know, or so employees. This is very different. I've got 35 in the States, right? So I could literally take them all to lunch in a, you know, in a month if I wanted to. And that's a, that's a better environment as a leader, I think, because you can spend more time getting to know people and getting to know, you know, I call it the platinum rule versus the, you know, the golden rule, right? You know, you really want to get somewhere, spend some time and understand how people want to be treated themselves, not how you want to be treated, right? Because not everybody wants to be treated like you, right? Everybody's got individual stuff going on in their lives. And so to provide that psychological safety for people, you can sort of get into their lives with them a little bit and understand what's driving them, what's frustrating them, what's, you know, it's, it's not just like, I don't care what happens to you when you're not here, right? I just want you here doing your job, right? That's the old way. The new way is, look, I know you got three kids at home and I know, you know, one of them's got COVID at any given time and we don't have a vaccine for the kids under five and, you know, and you and you're staying up until four o'clock in the morning trying to get your work done. And and anything I say to you is either going to make it worse or better. Right. Yeah. I have to have that in my head every day to provide that psychological safety to people. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. And I don't always get it right. You know, and but I'm always thinking about it, which is what I've I've I've, I've allowed myself um, the space to say I'm not perfect, mm -hmm. but I'm always trying to get better and I'm always trying to learn and I'm always trying to. I'm always trying to recover from something that I could have done better, right? And that, and that I think is the only journey that we can be on as leaders is to try to get better and to be really open to feedback. And to, you know, there's a lot going on around kindness um, uh, and, you know, probably the next take on servant leadership. But if you get out of that role of, you know, I'm here because I know everything and you all just need to salute and do what I tell you to do and everything's going to work out the way I want it to. Well, that doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, I don't know everything. Number two, particularly in this job where I've got a bunch of kids that they 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 speak and I, they have little analogies now for 
like stuff that like the pool, you know, the pool with all the data in it, the pool is draining. Okay. <laughs> which is okay. Which is okay. Yeah. Because I, I don't understand it and they have to do that. Right. And there's stuff I understand that they don't. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I do the same thing. And, and so it's a, it's been a really great experience for me having a smaller team. And then all of those skills that I learned formally on how to coach, you know, I know the psychology of it. I know, I know the end point. I know what I'm trying to get out of them as an employee. What's interesting is you start to feel like you're more a part of their, their success in life, mm -hmm. which is, you know, which is rewarding. It's more rewarding than, you know, than your board telling you, you got a great bottom line. Right. Oh. God, I love what you just said there. I, I, I really, really do, because I, I, I feel the same way, right? I, I think these leadership roles, Tyler and I have, have sat down with a lot of executives and leaders now, and and that is really, I, I think, that purpose, right, for, for, for a leader is like when you're managing the person and you're managing the work, that's not really rewarding, right? And, and, and yes, you can get compensated with bonus structures and, and salary increases, sure. Uh, and plenty of CEOs are making their fair share, right? But what you just said is that you realize the impact or the potential positive impact that you can have on the individual's life and their well-being and, they, and enable their success is really what it's all about. And I think knowing your intention there and kind of some of the, the, the background that you have and working really in the field alongside of some people that are probably forgotten by the rest of society sometimes. Um, I'm sure that made you more cognitively aware of, of, of all of that. Um, so I love, love that piece. Yeah, man, John, you, I think you got me unsick, man, especially <laughs> with that story you shared earlier with that lady that was in charge of 29 clinics you had no idea of, man. That, that's, that's what gets my gears going, guys. Um, it seems like you also get the heck out of your own way, John. Um, I keep hearing that over and over and over. Where, where did you learn that? And what, what, what do you do daily? To, to take yourself, like you keep saying, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I want. It doesn't matter what I, I, I. Where the heck did you learn that, man? Well, you know, you learn it through trial and error, you know? And when you're younger, um, you know, I, I, I've, my kids are a little older. I'm 52. My kids are 26 and 25. And, and, and um, you know, I've got some younger ones we're raising. And, you know, there's a time in your career where you're worried about money and you're worried about your family and you're worried about your kids having everything they need. And, and so some of it may just be where I'm at in my life, right? Um, because I've been in the job where I'm worried about the money and I'm worried about the position. And, and, it's, and it's never a good place to be as a leader because you're not making good decisions about good things. You're making decisions about things that don't really, that you don't have the perspective to understand don't really matter at the end of the day, right? The bonus isn't gonna be bigger because you pushed harder or you, you yelled at somebody instead of taking the time to let them cry in your office and tell you what's going on at home, right? You don't want to hear that. You just want them to do their job. You know, that's the, it's the easy, impulsive way to do it. And as human beings, I think we're all trying to figure out how we do it better, right? So it's not me getting out of my own way. It's, it's, uh, it's trial and error, right? I didn't, arrive, I didn't arrive here like this, right? When I was 29 and, you know, trying to figure out how to make, you know, uh, all that stuff at daycare work, right? There were a lot of people around me helping me who were putting their hand on my shoulder saying, you can't do that, you can't do that, don't do that again, right? Mm -hmm. and, and those are really important things. Having a mentor, having a team of people around you that gives you feedback, understanding what right looks like, right? So if you're not in a place where maybe it's not being done the way you wanna do it eventually, but they do it pretty good, right? And you tolerated some bad things to be there, but it taught you a lot, right? Those are all things that I look back on my career and say, they've all brought me to where I am today, you know, it, which is, you know, I'm sitting in a, you know, an old carriage factory in Rochester, New York, right? Having nothing to do with behavioral health or hospitals. And it's a freeing thing, right? But I learned everything I know through that experience. Now, I've got hospitals on my board. I've got insurance companies on my board. It comes in handy to have had a little experience in healthcare, but it, it um, it's just all about trying to, I think, grow and understand where you, you know, where, where you are. And, 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 and where I realized I was, was not, I didn't want to climb that, that ladder with a knife in my teeth. Mm -hmm. Right. It was not, it was killing me. It wasn't helping me. Right. And that, that's the difference, I think. 
Yeah. And I think a lot of people are starting to realize what are they willing to sacrifice from their career perspective in their in their personal lives. And, and I think that uh, the, for whatever reason, we realize that or reprioritize some things during the pandemic that we realize that fam- spending time with family is, is pretty awesome. Right. Having the opportunity to, to drop your kids off and see them wake up in the morning is pretty awesome, you know, and and I think people got glimpses of that, that, that we can have that balance or blend of, of work and life. Um, but it's also a restructuring of, of something that we've been conditioned our whole lives to not really believe here in America, you know, that, uh, that work is truly your life. And, uh, and I, I love what you shared is like the old way of thinking was that they always said, leave, leave your problems at the door. I, I still remember when I first joined the, like a company, leave it at the door. And it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'll just leave everything at the door and I'll pick it right back up when I leave, you know? Uh, but then we really realized, right, when uh, we were all sitting on Zoom just like this, that uh, what cat would dry, walk by, my son would be crying in my arms, but we couldn't separate our personal and professional lives anymore. What was something, uh, obviously, you stepping into the role that you are today, um, what did you have to learn about yourself, John, during the pandemic? I know Tyler and I, we met during the pandemic. We were doing this podcast. This is a passion project. I am a shell of the person that I, I, I once was two and a half years ago. I'm more of a man or, or believe that I know who I am uh, more today. What about your experience? What did you experience during the pandemic? And what, I guess, what did you learn about yourself? It's been transformative for me. Um, and then my wife's daughter from her first marriage, um, Gabrielle, uh, who, who lived with us from the time she was six when we got married until her recent death. You know, she died about a month ago um, from an opiate overdose, from fentanyl. And, um, and, I, and I, I got her into the Phoenix house. Um, for the first time, she got into 12 months of, uh, you know, I say I did, and you know, I used the relationship to get her into Phoenix house. She did 12 months of treatment. It's the first time we were really excited. She's 33 years old. She's got two young daughters who we love and we're helping to raise. And, um, and she got back out there and there's no, there's no opiates out there anymore. There's no heroin. It's just fentanyl. And she got a hot load of fentanyl and she, they found her dead in her bedroom um, at her dad's house with the door locked. And that was the culmination of, um, you know, for me, a lot, of, a lot of dramatic change, right? I changed, I left the job um that I didn't love uh in a place that I didn't love um in reaction to events that were occurring in the world that I I didn't know I was that passionate about but I was right as a leader I couldn't sit back and watch what was going on in you know with the George Floyd situation with the you know with the um you know just I I have three or four of my sons a quarterback a football player so I have three or four black sons that I have you know, spent a lot of time with, and I call them my sons, but we have spent a lot of time together uh, since they were 11 years old. They are my sons. And, um, and I have looked through their eyes and, and seen a lot of ugly things as well. And so for me, I think I've seen a lot more ugliness in the last two and a half to three years than I would have preferred. Um, and it has broken me in some ways. Um, And when I say broken, I mean in a good way, right? It's broken me of some thinking, right? I I don't, I don't have the answers to most of these questions, right? But I've seen a lot, right? I have a lot of, you know, whatever wisdom is defined as, right? Maybe it's just how much crap you've seen, right? Um, And and how you've done the right thing or the wrong thing, but you know what you wouldn't do again, right? Those are the those are the lessons that I try to focus on instead of trying to find that one right answer or that one explanation or that one thing that's going to, you know, lead us out of this, right? We, we got a, we got a world in trouble here and we all have a responsibility to try to make it better. And that's, you know, that's kind of where I'm at right now in, in my journey. So. Lee, man. Sorry to hear that, John. And, and thanks for sharing that with us, yeah. man. That's, yeah. that's out there. I was public about it because I wanted, I mean, we were public. We wanted people to understand, but it's something a lot of people are going through. Yeah. And she was out there for, you know, 10 years, 15 years. And, you know, it was, yeah. it was bad. 
I, I appreciate you sharing that with us and, 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 and I can't imagine that loss. And, and I, I think that what you said is it broke you. And, and I think a lot of people felt broken during the pandemic and, and, but how did you put those pieces back together? Did you improve? Did you get worse? And, and it sounds like, I mean, her, some of those things that we would never wish upon our, our, our worst enemy um, happened to you in a, in a, in a, oh, a, a short amount of time. Um, yeah, it's a very serious thing that's going on in our country. It's a, an area of focus that we continue to, to have some of the highest rates of addiction in, in, in our country. And a lot of it, I think, probably gets back to, to the mental health side of things that uh, people just really aren't healing. We haven't provided them the resources, the outlets, the, the tools that they need to, to really handle some of those, those, those challenges that we all face in different ways. Everybody's addicted to something. It just might not be drugs. It might be their cell phone, um, which is which is just a, a, has a, a negative impact probably on other relationships and, and a draining of their energy as well. I really, really loved your line about looked through their, the, their eyes, right? Uh, in particular to the diversity, equity, and inclusion challenges that we, we continue to face here in this country. I thought we were much further along back in 2008 myself when I got to uh, vote in my first election there. Um, but I think you understanding that you have a responsibility as a white male, as a president, as a CEO, to use that as an opportunity to empower others and enable others, just like you shared earlier in the conversation, is, is, is giving me goosebumps. But that's the reason why Tyler and I do this show, is to find the great people like you that are really committed to making a difference. I don't care how much money you make. I care about how many lives that you're touching and impacting on a daily basis. And you doing those things with the 35 people that are here in the States right now, I can't help but believe that those 35 people with their families aren't going to uh, have a have a little um, multiplication of their impact on the community. Thanks to thanks to you as well. So, um, in wrapping and closing up, I, I just want to say thank you. Um, I really, really want to thank you so much for your time, John. This was a fascinating conversation to really talk about kind of your career, how you got into leadership, but ending on how how you continue to learn from from challenge, um, and, and and you know that. Uh, Things are going to be changed. Things are not always easy, but uh, I really love your perspective that you shared today. And I really think the audience is going to take a lot of these things as tangible takeaways to start applying in their own, own lives. Great. I appreciate it, guys. I, I think it's, it's important to talk about this kind of stuff. You know, it, it, um, there are such great things going on in this community. And the Rio is working with Common Ground Health. We're working with FLIPS. We're working with some of these existing organizations. And there's a lot of Medicaid money coming into the state of New York. And I've just been really encouraged by the way the community comes together. Here, right? There's obviously issues that need to be worked out, but there's a lot to work with here. And uh, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting some pieces back together. It's a good place to do that. And, uh, and I'm really excited to be here. And, I, and this is just another example of good community work. So thank you guys for that. Well, consider ourselves lucky to have leaders like you here. Uh, cause, uh, this is back stronger highlighting people that are trying to make a difference you know i'm not going to necessarily be one of the people at the top of the list but there are people in this community really working hard um, to make it better for people and that's, well, that's important these are one of them so thanks thank you thank you john where did we find you man you were something <laughs> and marie cook uh one and of my other favorites yeah oh yeah <laughs> Other reason than Anne Marie Cook. That is I the was, reason. She was freaking <laughs> phenomenal, man. And and the more that I meet, bold. It doesn't sound like where I want to go. I don't know anything about tech. Same thing. Anne Marie Cook got me here. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome.